if the official state media's reveling in images of violence and chaos on American streets was perfectly predictable, the, the reaction of the oppositional uh, liberal Russian intelligentsia exposed even greater reservoirs of racism. The big question that that reaction begged was how a state and a society that had once been at the forefront of the global struggles against racism could reach the place where they are today. Soviet anti-imperialism abroad and nationalities policy at home in the first decades of Bolshevik rule were never ideal, but they represented the most progressive and emancipatory force at the time, as many visitors of color to the Soviet Union were keen to testify. So what had happened uh, to it in the years between the 1920s and now? Thanks to Sasha Spitalnik's efforts, we have a dream team of scholars who will endeavor to answer this question. We will not exhaust it. This will take a much greater effort, many more books and articles than we currently have. But they will establish the main lines of inquiry, which need to be kept together if we are to answer it as a whole. In the first place, this is the experience of African visitors whose presence in Soviet cities served as the main barometer for racial attitudes. Secondly, this is Soviet nationality's policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis the peoples of Central Asia and the Caucasus, many of whom have over the last two decades become labor migrants in Russia and thus the most exploited, discriminated against and racialized subjects in the country. And finally, it is the experience of former Soviet citizens abroad, especially in the States, the racialization of some and the claims to whiteness projected by others. These will be the topics the panel will cover. Now let me pass the baton to Sasha Spitalnik, the Jordan Center administrator, who will explain exactly how we are going, going about doing that. Thank you so much, Ross. And uh, so for those of us who joined, joined us at previous Jordan Center events, my spiel today will be much, much shorter. I'm just letting you all know that uh, you can submit your questions via the Q&A function, which is at the bottom at your, of your window. Um, and you can submit them at any time and they will be answered at the end of the event uh, once all of the panelists have finished speaking. And that's all I have. So back to you, Ross, and thank you. Great, so I'll be introducing speaker, our speakers one by one. And it is really my great pleasure to be introducing Harold Weaver, who sees the subject uh, of, not of race in Russia, not only as a scholar, but as an actual witness, having spent two years in Moscow in the early, 90, in the early 60s, uh, and an activist operating at the intersection of the African-American and Pan-African movements. Subsequently, uh, Harold was the founding chair of the Department of Africana Studies at Rutgers, as well as uh, later founding the Black Film Project, the Black Quaker Project, the China Africa Russia Project. He is now retired but continues to, uh, to work actively towards cross cultural communication, respect and understanding through film, media, education, and the arts. His talk today is drawn from a forthcoming chapter entitled Decolonization and the Cold War, African Student Elites in the Soviet Union, 1955 to 1964. Take it away, Hal. Hal, you're muted. Am I unmuted? Okay. Rosen, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to see you again, not having seen you since we were in an African studies meeting in Moscow in 2014. And I'm, of course, I'm happy to see Maxime again. Haven't seen him since we were at a conference in UK in 2017 on the red and the black, the Russian revolution and the Black Atlantic. Um, happy to meet our new panelists and I'm happy to share with those of you who are participating, listening to this today. 
I first want to ask Cooper to start with our first AV. Race decolonization. United forever in friendship and labor, our mighty republics will ever. Colleagues, today our presentation challenges some of the widespread Western beliefs about Africans' participation in trans Soviet transnational programs in education and human resource development. During one phase of the Cold War, the early 1960s. Drawing upon our actual field experiences in Moscow in summer of 1959, summer of 61, summer of 62, and July 1963 to February 1964, as a participant in the official USA-USSR Youth Exchange Program, as participant in the World Youth Forum, as sojourner in Moscow after the World Youth Festival in Helsinki, and as a journalist accredited by the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs, respectively, we seek to fill the gap between conventional wisdom and a shortage of evidence. We examine the opportunities and realities that Sub-Saharan Africans, Black Africans, were exposed to in Moscow during this important African decolonizing period. A contrast to the limitations and the deficiencies in their home countries as defined by African political leaders and scholars. We will respond to the following questions today. Hopefully we can finish them. Based primarily on my personal field experiences as participant observer and as interviewer. The first question, why was it necessary for Sub-Saharans that is black Africans to go to the USSR for formal post-secondary education. What were these Africans seeking in the USSR that they could not find at home? And number two, the major question today, how did the USSR respond to African needs in education and human resources development in creating a new friendship university for the peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. A subset of questions related to this key overriding question is as follows. How did the African students get there? How were they recruited and selected? What did black Africans find affectively in Moscow? How were they received and treated? And finally, looking at this cognitively, looking at the cognitive aspects of their experience, how did the emerging curricula of Friendship University address African needs and priorities? So that, those, that's what I intend to do today. But as I begin my uh, formal presentation, I would like to share with you two audiovisual images of significant, relevant, and unexpected events that happened during the period of my research in Moscow in the early 1960s. Both occurred in the fall of 1963. The first, is the assassination of President John F. Kennedy on the 22nd of November, 1963. And the very surprising, the very surprising Moscow public 
and governmental responses that I was able to feel and see and listen to. Cooper, Walter Cronkite announcing Kennedy. From Dallas, Texas, the flash apparently official President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. For those of you who are old enough, do you remember where you were at that moment? Many people in my generation, that was a frozen moment in time. Not yet, Cooper, on this one. I was at the apartment, yes, Cooper, you're ready, of Lily Golden, who Maxine knows. Uh, Lily was an Afro-Soviet researcher in African studies. And um, we were talking and her mother is to the left. Her mother was Jewish, Polish, and with her African-American husband. And they left the States because of racism, because they could not survive as an interracial couple in the 1930s, and because they were very active in the American Communist Party. So Golden went to the Soviet Union as a refugee from the United States because of the kind of treatment he was getting. What amazed me as I was talking to Lily and this announcement went over Moscow radio, Lily's mother, Bertha, Bertha Golden saying, oh my God, they have killed that young man. I can even remember the intonation of some, what was that, some 60, almost 60 years ago. Her response, her emotional response. And on the streets of Moscow, people were crying. People were ringing my hotel room to, to express their condolences. Next, Cooper. And the Soviet government responded by shutting down all radio in Moscow and playing this funeral music for John F. Kennedy from Tchaikovsky's Pathetic. Thank you, Cooper. So these images remain very close to me, very vividly with me. And the second occurred just a few weeks after that on 18 December, 1963 a demonstration of African students in Red Square. This was reported in much of the press as being the first unauthorized protest since 1917. I can't vouch for that, but that's, that's how it was tooted, both in Moscow and uh, elsewhere. What happened was that a Ghanaian student had died, had frozen to death. And there were accusations that he was murdered because he was about to marry a Russian woman the following weekend. We were, many of us were invited to the Ghanaian embassy to get a report, official report from the ambassador, Ambassador Elliot, about what had happened. For some reason, after we gathered at the embassy, there was a march to Red Square. I have no idea 
whether that was planned or was spontaneous. But several hundred of us walked through the streets from the Ghanaian embassy to Red Square um, as a kind of a silent uh, protest. This is how this was reported in the American press. Cooper will show us several examples. The New York Times, 500 Africans fight police in Moscow in race. African students, a, a, a newspaper, a Carol newspaper out in Iowa, African students riot, battle police. In, uh, and the final one from uh, uh, Green Bay, and I, I'm sorry, I can't see the whole, I need to move some things in order to be able to see. The African students storm Kremlin in racial riot. Well, Friends and colleagues, there was no riot. There was a demonstration that you saw pictures of and that Cooper will now show you some video images of that were taken at that moment, but there was no riot. There were signs of protest that Moscow is becoming like Alabama and things of that sort, but this was an overreaction by the American press, including the New York Times. Now, what was interesting about that Times piece was that Tanner was not a regular, <clears throat> a regular correspondent in Moscow. Um, what I noticed as a, as a correspondent there myself was that uh, the American journalists tended to get together uh, before releasing a story to make sure that no one scooped another person. It was a really a kind of interesting thing that I'd never seen anywhere else in the world of how the uh, US car correspondents uh, cooperated with each other rather than try to scoop. Well, our friend Tanner was very much, uh, of course he had nothing to do with the, out with the headline anyway, but his uh, negative portrayal was, uh, was something that uh, was not agreed upon by, by all the correspondents who, who sent, um, who sent um, uh, messages uh, home. Um, so let's go now to the, some of the questions I want to raise today. Why was it necessary for black African students to be in the USSR, what of importance were black Africans seeking in Moscow that they could not find at home? The first thing is mental emancipation and the fight against white supremacy. Mental emancipation and the fight against white supremacy for those students who were still under colonial rule like those in South Africa, for example. The late 1950s and 1960s represent a critical period in the emergence of nationalism and unprecedented uprisings against European domination in Africa. Remember that in 1955, there were only three nominally independent states in Sub-Saharan Africa. But by 1964, there were 29 territories in Africa that had achieved constitutional independence. And there was also a rising objection against the inferiority of status as members of a particular race. Let us take the example of Patrice Lumumba, for whom the Friendship University in Moscow was named as representative of African leadership. As the newly elected first prime minister, he was the most outspoken of all the African leaders during the Congolese independence ceremony, marking the transition from colonialism 
to constitutional independence. And although this was expressed more emotionally and perhaps much stronger than leaders from the Frank of, from the uh, from the French the African colonies under France and the African colonies under Britain, it was basically the quality of racism was the same. Let me quote Lumumba at independence ceremonies in the presence of high Belgian and other officials. We have known the mockery, the insults, the blows submitted to us morning, noon, and night because we were negra. We have known the law was never the same whether dealing with a white or a Negro, that it was accommodating for the one, cruel and inhuman to the other. We have known that in the cities, there were magnificent houses for whites and crumbling hovels for the Negroes. That a Negro was not admitted to movie theaters or restaurants that he was not allowed to enter so-called European stores. And that when the Negro traveled, it was on the lowest level of a boat at the feet of the white man in his deluxe cabin. Next slide, Cooper, please. The next, the second point that I want to make as to why Africans were studying in the Soviet Union at this time in the early 1960s is that there were major higher education deficiencies, major education deficiencies in throughout colonized Africa. And these were some of the deficiencies that were led African students, made it imperative for, imperative for African students to take advantage of study abroad programs offered by other nations in order to acquire the skills and knowledge needed for independence. One is that the curriculum in these colonized countries, that their education in these colonized countries reflected an orientation towards Europe towards Europe, both in content and in language of instruction. So the orientation was to Europe. Second, a focus, there was a focus on humanistic studies. Students were not studying science and technology that they needed in order to become independent. Third, there was a neglect of schooling opportunities for females. And fourth, there was a shortage and underutilization of higher education. So how did the Soviet Union respond to these problems? They built alternative programs that Africa's scholars, nationalists, and elites could embrace if they chose to. And how did the new Friendship University step into this void. Next slide, Cooper, please. Here's a picture of Patrice Lumumba, for those of you who are being exposed to him for the first time, and for others as a reminder. <clears throat> so Patrice Lumumba University, a new experimental higher education institution in Moscow for newly dependent African states. We're focusing on Africa, but we also obviously know that it was for Asians and Latin Americans. So how did it, cars, how did it respond to African needs? In order to help newly independent sub-Saharan African countries overcome deficiency in human resources, Soviet authorities established an experimental post-secondary institution, Lumumba University. 
And what was the purpose? It was to give aid to colonial and neo-colonial countries in the training of national cadres. And now I am quoting Premier, uh, the head of the Soviet government and the head of the Soviet party, Nikita Khrushchev, as he announced this university founding in Indonesia in February of 1960, his first trip uh, to the third world. The university was to give aid to colonial and neo-colonial countries in the training of their national cadres of engineers, agricultural specialists, doctors, teachers, economists, and specialists in other branches of knowledge. So the Soviet government has decided to set up in Moscow a university of the friendship of peoples, end of quote. A significant factor about the university was the attention given to recruiting what Khrushchev called talented young people coming from poor families. In his speech, he recognized some of the problems many Africans themselves considered as limiting Africa's progress and development. Prominent of all of this was that there was little attention paid to technology and to the applied sciences in higher education in Africa. My next question is, how did African students get to Moscow? And we'll be very brief on this one because we were already running behind time uh, and looking at recruitment and selection. Uh, the Soviets used a wide variety of, uh, of uh, recruiters. Uh, I witnessed in, in Helsinki and the Youth Festival of 62, uh, the recruitment campaign of current students at uh, Friendship University uh, was a very aggressive, relying heavily on third world students themselves who often worked together in congenial teams, minimal, minimal bureaucracy, a focus on students obviously geared to meet African manpower needs and an emphasis on opportunities for training in fields which Africans were not receiving at home or in the West. And you had uh, the pro-rector Yersin uh, going out to Asia and to Africa to recruit uh, high quality students. You had Soviet consulates and embassies in Asia, Africa and Latin America uh, doing the dissemination of information and the reception of applications. Uh, as well as the uh, active involvement of the home offices of several international organizations, which some of you are familiar with, and uh, Rosen has recently written about, uh, one, the uh, Afro-Asian Solidarity Committee in uh, Cairo. You had the World Fre Federation of Democratic Youth in Budapest and the uh, International Union of Students in Prague, um, so-called front organizations that were very active in recruiting students. Um, so in this recruitment and selection, I want to just mention a case that I came upon in Kenya of a doctor. Um, this is a spectacular example of a young Kenyan student so highly motivated to becoming a doctor that he actually walked from Nairobi, Kenya to Cairo, Egypt over a two year period, assured that if he reached Cairo, he would be able to study free of charge in one of the European socialist countries. In his case, he was assigned medical school in Poland his story continued to be a happy one. He married a Polish classmate in medical school, raised a family of two successful filmmakers and television creators, and later returned to Kenya with her when they became immersed in the Kenyan health system. What did African students actually find during their sojourn in Moscow? How were they treated? This is sort of the active 
the affective part that I want to deal with. We, men we mentioned earlier the nature of racism, white superiority during the colonial rule. And this was the, that time of transfer change. Uh, even some of those uh, characteristics remain after independence because even though the countries were constitutionally independent, they were not independent economically and the economic structure pretty much remained the same in many of the countries. <clears throat> so can you imagine when you arrive in the Soviet Union from Africa in the early 60s, you're given preferential treatment. You're given preferential treatment by a system that insisted that you succeed. A system that, that insisted that you succeed. From my participant observation, I found they were generally warmly welcomed by faculty, fellow students, and the general population. Their warm experiences seemed to replicate the welcome of earlier African-American sojourning artists, Langston Hughes and Paul Robeson, who sang a bit of the Soviet national anthem earlier in our presentation. <clears throat> Robeson had gone to the USSR in December of 1934 as a guest of the legendary filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein, to make a film about the significant Haitian revolution. He responded to his enthusiastic welcome by the artistic and political elites and the general population and the general population alike. And I quote him, for the first time in my life, I walk in full human dignity. For the first time in my life, I walk in full human dignity. But it was the warm, passionate sexual relations, I am convinced, that I observed between African males and Soviet females that was especially empowering <clears throat> for many African males. At the same time, that antagonized some of their Soviet male counterparts, sometimes causing friction. And then there were drunken Soviet men and women who were heard to curse German Khrushchev for bringing in favored foreigners who they said were taking valuable resources away from Soviet students and other citizens. But these were the exceptions in my observation and not the rule, as mainstream Western media and scholarship would have us believe. University preparatory faculty often even came to the African students' dorm rooms to give them one-on-one -on -one tutorials to help with the Russian language, skills, knowledge development, and acclimation to Soviet society. And the final major point I want to make now relates to the cognitive. How did the Lumumba University Friendship University curricula respond to sub-Saharan African needs and priorities? If we look at this, um, and, and by the way, getting data is, was, in, was not easy. And so these are approximates. Um, these are primarily from a press conference that the rector had in December, early December of 63. And uh, his figures were given as approximate. But what we can basically see as we look at the engineering, which includes geology, what, which I want to talk on, uh, focus on a bit, medicine, physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology, agriculture, philology, and history, economics, and international law and the preparatory faculty um, um, for about a total of 2,325 students. So approximately of these um, students in the main faculties, um, 1,725, uh, about approximately 1,200 or 70% were majoring in the natural, physical, and medical sciences. That is of all, we're talking about all the students now. 
and a, a press conference at the, by the university's rector in, <coughs> that I intended and attended on the 3rd of December, 63, revealed that the percentage of Africans in medicine, engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, and agriculture was at least 75%, perhaps even higher. So contrary to those reports in the press, Western press that said that the students were learning uh, warfare and were doing Mickey Mouse things, um, my observations um, uh, proved uh, that completely different. Um, I would like to say something about the preparatory faculty now but I don't have the time to do, give that much attention. It was basically a transition period of one to three years in which students were obviously learning the, the difficult Russian language in which they were learning study skills because remember a number of these had come out of or non-traditional students had not gone through the regular uh, secondary system in, uh, in the colonial period. Um, some of this uh, was intensified capsule of secondary training and uh, finally uh, acclimation to Soviet society. So let's go to the natural resources geology department, Cooper, please. Um, I want to to end my presentation with some discussion of this, the geology department as a representative case study of how the university responded to African needs as articulated in this case by Soviet political leaders and scholars. The Lumumba University correctly reflected the priority of Soviet political and academic leaders for training African personnel training African personnel for African control of Africa's natural resources. Something that still has escaped the reality of the African continent, <clears throat> even in 2020. The geology department of the Faculty of Engineering prominently epitomized this priority. All engineering students were required to make a preliminary decision of, during their first year about the concentration either in geology, civil engineering, or mechanical engineering. But it was the geology majors who received training in the prospecting, extracting, and utilization of natural resources. At the end of a four-year course, a successful geology major left with a master's degree in mining engineering. <coughs> Excuse me. Training was not limited to the classroom. Practical work was gained through work in mines and oil fields and laboratories and in geological expedition. Their training culminated and the production of a research paper that documented the findings from the students' research project on their own country. So keep this in mind that this university was, was founded and stuck to the principles of educating people from third world countries primarily, although there was a fraction of Russian students there, Soviet students there, but the focus was on how you use this education when you go home. And African students in Moscow could observe the actions of Soviet political leaders and academicians. What was the relationship between the curriculum and geology at the university on the one hand and African realities on the other? As pinpointed by Soviet political leadership and senior so Soviet Africanist researchers. We remember, or some of us remember, Khrushchev's infamous banging of the shoe at the UN General Assembly, which probably many of us know more about that 
in some cases at least, than, than anything else he did. But at this particular UN General Assembly, he made the following profound important statement. And I quote him, the peoples of many of these countries have won political independence, but they are still cruelly exploited by foreigners economically. Their oil and other natural resources are being plundered. They're being taken out of their countries for almost nothing in return, even while they yield huge profits to the foreign exploiters. I want to end this now because I have outspoken my time with the following conclusion. This is my summary of what I wanted to share with you today. Limited national higher education facilities made it necessary for sub-Saharan Africans, that is black Africans, to utilize transnational opportunities in order to obtain rapid indigenization or Africanization of human resources. The Soviet programs, and there were many besides uh, Lumumba University, the Soviet programs in this critical period of African decolonization, the early 60s, demonstrated creative and pragmatic innovation. One, in program dedicated to African needs and priorities with curricula focused on technology, health, and natural and physical sciences, including geology. <clears throat> Number two, in non-traditional admissions procedures, often for non-traditional students. And three, with a formal education environment for mental emancipation and self-empowerment of future African leaders. Lumumba University helped provide Sub-Saharan Africans, Black Africans, the necessary knowledge and skills for helping move their fragile countries towards full independence. Those whom I later met in Africa or elsewhere express their gratitude for that opportunity. I thank you. We warmly welcome your questions and comments. We're currently working on our memoirs, including our interactions with various socialist areas China, Cuba, and Zanzibar, Tanzania. We would be happy to respond to questions about our experiences with those areas as well. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to interacting with you. Thank you so much, Hal. You really can speak about Soviet internationalism of the Syria in a way that almost nobody can. And we are really very lucky that you joined us. So our second speaker, uh, Zuhra Kasimova, originally comes from Tashkent. Her trajectory took her to an MA degree in at the Central European University in Budapest, and subsequently to the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she's completing a PhD in history. She's also currently a Jordan Center Fellow. Her talk will draw on her dissertation tentatively entitled A Hybrid Modernity, Forging Soviet Uzbekistan, 1941-1980. Thank you very much for, for an introduction and uh, for uh, inviting me uh, to be part of this panel. And thank you, Sasha, for organizing this. Um, I'll try to share my um, PowerPoint slides right now. Let me know if it works. Can you see it? Great. So um, today I'll speak briefly um, about ethnic, linguistic, and cultural hybridity in post-World War II Uzbekistan based on the example of the 
family, uh, Uzbek family that adopted multiple um, children of various nationalities and how that story fits into the post-World War II Soviet um, story of friendship of peoples and how the story had been adjusted and how it changed over the decades in the post-World War II era in the Soviet context. So um, I'll start with a quote. Various American local daily news uh, reported in 1964 that the family of an Ahmed blacksmith identified as Ahmed Shah Mahmudov may be the most multinational in the world the TASS news agency reported, Ahmed and his wife adopted 14 children of soldiers killed in World War II, including Uzbeks, Russians, Jews, Tatars, Moldavians, and Gypsies. Uh, indeed, um, the main Soviet information agency, TASS, ran a short article on this Uzbek family as an exemplar of Soviet friendship of the peoples for international propaganda. But within the Soviet Union itself too, this adoptive family served the same propaganda purposes and directly inspired a poem, a novel, and a movie. Um, these are the stills from the movie. And also um, the Shah Mahmudov family was celebrated in a public monument in the capital city of Uzbekistan in Tashkent. And uh, they were also commemorated in a street name. This is a monument that was installed in Tashkent in 1980s. Um, it has the blacksmith, his wife, and 15 children. So um, although in various newspapers over the decades, the number of adopted children varied from 13 to 16 and then to 19, uh, usually what we see and what was um, shown in this monument that there were 15 adopted children, which was supposed to, of course, um, represent the Soviet friendship of 15 Soviet national republics. So, of course, Shah Mahmoud's were not the only family that welcomed the orphaned, unaccompanied children that were evacuated to Central Asia. In the Uzbek SSR, Soviet Socialist Republic alone, for example, there was a person, um, Hamid Samatov, an unmarried Red Army veteran who adopted 13 orphans. There was Fatima Kasimova, a female uh, who worked in the regional coal host whose husband was at the front and she single-handedly adopted 10 children while simultaneously acting as the head of the collective farm. There was also a widow, um, Bakhrihona Shirhajaeva, who adopted eight children. And there were numerous examples. And I'll try to explore and ask a question as to why Shah Mahmoudus were cho chosen as, a, um, as an example to represent the Soviet friendship of people. So contrary to the single parent family, Shah Mahmoudov stood out as an example of universalized ideal of the nuclear family, uh, where parents represent the nation and the Soviet state at the same time, with the multi-ethnic children epitomizing various Soviet republics. Moreover, all, all of the Shah Mahmoudov's adopted um, adoptees acquired solid working class professions, such as miners, mechanics, engineers, uh, thereby serving as a positive example of Soviet um, upward mobility. So um, I'll look at Shah Mahmoudov's case to explore practices of children's adoption during World War II years, their interpretation of the official Soviet and national Uzbek discourses, most importantly, a new social reality that these practices and discourses produced. Um, I intend to show that the pre-war Soviet ideology of national evolutionism, which was built um, on the notion of nation building as an evolutionary stage of modernization leading to embracing a socialist uh, content had been undermined and hybridized in the post-war era. So having arrived in Central Asia during World War II, predominantly from the Russified, urbanized, and industrialized Western Soviet regions, unaccompanied children were internally displaced in the Turkic-speaking, historically Muslim, and rather traditional society. Social, linguistic, and cultural integration of these orphans into local adoptive families was, in the essence, a reverse integration. Uh, into a society that was marked by Bolsheviks as backward and peripheral, and hence was bound to represent the opposite of modern and quintessentially Soviet. However, such integration of ethnically Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Jewish children into the Uzbek nation, which held a lower ranking in the Soviet taxonomy of nations, turned out to be the most Soviet, Soviet experience of all and served to, to benefit 
these children and to benefit of the Uzbek National Soviet Republic as well. Having been fostered and oftentimes adopted by Central Asian locals, these children quickly became bi or trilingual, acquired an extended family, um, enhanced a social support system, and learned to speak Soviet. Um, these children, unlike majority of their Soviet peers elsewhere, were given a choice who they would like to be identity-wise. So probably here I should briefly reconstruct the Shah Mahmud of story. Um, so they were from Tashkent, from a capital uh, city in Uzbekistan. They were married before the Russian Revolution, and they had no biological children of their own. This is somewhat important to the story because all other adoptive families had their biological children. So those cases differ, like structurally and strategically. For example, how do you, you know, treat children, uh, adoptive and biological ones alike? and all sorts of different uh, questions arise. But in case Shah Mahmoud also had no children of their own and um, they were bo both working class, they worked in the artel, Sham um, Ahmed as a blacksmith and his wife Bahri as a saddler. So in society such as the pre-war Uzbek society, family remained the least Sovietized social sphere, um, the least accessible for official discourse and state regulation. Historians have argued that traditional Central Asian family before World War II um, tended to create obstacles for the Soviet modernization. And actually this adoption, um, normalization of adoption of non-Uzbek, non-Central Asian orphans during the World War II be had been used as an opportunity by the Soviet state to involve lo local traditional Muslim women into the public sphere, into the Soviet public sphere uh, specifically. Um, so, in addition to the traditional language of the family of Soviet nations, the rhetoric and imagery of protecting motherland and individual family also looms large in the story. Um, this context explains why Shah Mahmudovs were celebrated as an embodiment of friendship of the 15 Soviet national republics. Um, so, through this case, uh, I hope we'll be able to see the evolution of power relationship within the family of Soviet. Uh, nations that rested on the inversion of the hierarchy of Russian and Uzbek, modern and traditional, universal Soviet and national Uzbek. The wartime destabilization of these hierarchies, uh, the real and symbolic power acquired by the traditional Uzbek family and the Uzbek Republic in general, as a pattern of children evacuated from U European parts of the USSR and the experience of generation of children who were thus adopted and integrated into different um, into de different reality in a sense. And they have to reinvent themselves as, um, you know, to imagine themselves as members of the Soviet, but this time Uzbek society, while ethnically they were very different. Um, as I intend to show, World War II orphans and Central Asian families largely adopted local languages, traditions, culture, and way of life. And that eventually in the post-war years, it became a problem on how to explore their national belonging. Were they Uzbek, were they Jewish, were they Russian? Um, because culturally uh, and linguistically, they were more, more Uzbek, or at least they were bilingual and bicultural. Um, so that becomes uh, a problem of self-representation uh, and um, interpretation. So I try to interpret their experiences of these children who grew up in Soviet Uzbekistan. Um, as symptoms of inverted colonial situation when Slavic and other non-Central Asian children found themselves dependent on the least integrated and least Sovietized strata of the Soviet population. Um, so I'll show you several examples of, um, I'll try to zoom in on some of these children. So you would see how different they were and how um, over the course of the war and after they were adopted, they, um, they learned Uzbek, they learned local traditions and so forth. So first foster children were Raya Maltseva, a Jewish um, girl from Belarus and Malika, a local Uzbek girl. So uh, I'll try to show through the newspaper coverage how adoption of these two girls had been represented. I have to skip ahead here. Um, so 
local Uzbek daily newspaper um, depicts the family's fostering choices as follows. They say that um, Ahmed, of all the children, um, picked a non-Slavic girl, Malika, um, thinking that she would look more like his biological daughter, because of course, local Uzbek girl would look like Uzbek adoptive parents. Russian language central newspaper Izvestia, on the other hand, ignores the fostering of Uzbek girl Malika as it did not fit into the multinational agenda of the friendship of the peoples. So Izvestia claimed that the first child taken in by the Shamahmudovs was a seven-year-old Belarusian Jewish girl, Raya Maltseva. So that's how it's depicted in the Izvestia article. Raya is a blue-eyed blonde girl with freckles on her short nose. She remembers that her father had been killed and her mother had died. Although Ahmed and Bahri, the adoptive parents, spoke Uzbek, whereas Raya spoke Russian, they understood each other perfectly well. Her ways of expressing emotions are universal across all languages. Raya quickly felt at home in her new parents' house. She quickly picked Uzbek and her adoptive parents picked some Russian. So this story uh, depicts that they basically, when Raya was fostered by this family, they didn't even speak the same language. She didn't have any common language at all. So local Uzbek newspaper paints a totally different picture of this adoption case of the Belarusian Jewish girl Raya. After fostering Malika, they say, um, Uzbek girl, the couple returned to the orphanage because Ahmed was determined to take the most unattractive girl of all. Of course, here we could see how the girl who looked very different ethnically from them would, would look unattractive because uh, she didn't fit into the traditional Uzbek narrative of how, you know, attractive, beautiful children look like. But again, the family uh, says they decided to pick a girl that didn't look like them. And they reiterate that they treated both girls, the Uzbek and the Belarusian girl, the same um, as their biological children. So it was reported over time when the family picked up more children, uh, that adoptees quickly picked up colloquial Uzbek and became bilingual. They also were given Uzbek names. That's, um, of course, these are the, you know, pictures for the newspapers. Probably the family was instructed to act a certain way and pose um, for photographs, but you can see how the Soviet propaganda tries to uh, represent this family as, you know, everybody went to, at least got some school education, and they show how Ahmed, the adoptive father, is reading the letters that people were sending him from across the Soviet Union, uh, thanking him for adopting so many multi-ethnic children. But interestingly, of course, in reality, Ahmed spoke some Russian, but his wife never picked up any Russian, it seems. So mostly when they received the letters written in Russian, the children, um, Russian speaking children that they adopted would be the ones who would be translating um, those letters to them and would serve as mediators between Russian speaking and Uzbek speaking world. Um, I also want to uh, focus on another adopted child from this family. His name originally was Fyodor and he was from Ukraine. He was a Jewish boy from Ukraine. And so that's another example of how pretty much every child, regardless of the original nationality they belong to, Shamahuda family would give them a local Uzbek name. Uh, this was mostly because they wanted to maybe kind of integrate them into their local traditions. And in some cases, of course, when children um, arrived um, by train and hawk, they would not have any, any paperwork with them. And some of those children were as small as four or five years old. And sometimes they could not even um, remember their name. So uh, Fyodor, that's how Fyodor, uh, who was five at the time when he was um, evacuated to Uzbekistan and subsequently adopted, he was given a name Yuldash. Uh, he was adopted to Ukrainian Jewish boys were adopted pretty much together, uh, maybe like a week, um, in a week of time. Yuldash and Ergash, uh, the real names of Fyodor and Sasha. Um, 
so of course these names mean something that it's it's very traditional in in turkic speaking languages when the name actually bears certain meaning and like it's supposed to serve as a characteristic of that child so yudash uh, fyodor he followed the boy sasha originally the family wanted to adopt only Sasha, but then they saw that the two kids were friends and they decided to pick Fyodor as well. That's why Yuldash, it's, uh, it's translated directly from Turkic as fellow traveler. So they basically picked up the second child because he was still attached to his friend. So all of these names usually mean something. And what is interesting, these children growing up, most of them did um, retain both of their names. The original name, um, which their biological parents gave them at birth if they knew that name. Um, but officially in their Soviet passports, they had their Uzbek names, which they acquired through their adoptive family. Um, so here there is a quote from Fyodor. Of course, when children grew up in 1970s, they were adults in 1980s, they would be interviewed um, for Soviet press. And this is one of the quotes from what Fyodor said in 1980s. I do not know when and where I was born. I do not remember a locale that I've been evacuated from to Tashkent. I do not know what nationality I had originally belonged to. One thing I know for the fact is that I was raised in Uzbek. Uzbekistan is my homeland and Soviet is my nationality. nationality. Um, this is interesting to see how these children basically are fashioning themselves depending on the Soviet post-war discourse. Um, of course, he did know from which exact province in Ukraine he was evacuated, but he knew for the fact because he had the paperwork that he was from Ukraine. Um, later on, in late 1980s, Fyodor was able, after 40 years um, after the war, he was able to track down his grandmother and travel to Ukrainian SSR to meet his grandmother and aunt. But he still was kind of, trying to fashion, refashion his identity based on how he imagined it, depending on the circumstances. So in 1982, before he found his grandmother, he says, I'm an Uzbek. I was raised Uzbek. I'm a Soviet citizen. 1986, after he found his grandmother, I'm sure his narrative changes a little. Also, it is important to see how, depending on what nationality children belong to, um, some of those nationalities officially recorded in the paperwork would be changed. For example, when Shamahmudovs were to receive a badge of honor for fostering so many children, which happened in late 1950s, the first secretary of the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic at the time, um, Sharaf Rashidov, vouched for the family. He asked, you know, he sent, Rashidov sent a letter to Moscow asking to give this honor to the family in 1955. And he includes a list of all the children that had been adopted, of course, for this multi-ethnic brotherhood of nations, friendship of people narrative. It is important to show how multinational the kids are. But Rashida, because it's like, you know, 1955, two years after Stalin died, anti-Semitism is still there. He purposefully, amidst the Jewish um, belonging of these two children, of Yuldash and Ergash, he lists them as Russian. It's interesting to see that all other children are pretty much listed um, with the same nationality that they had in their original papers, but Yuldash and Ergash, two Jewish kids, are changed to Russians. And the girl, the Roma, what they call gypsy girl from Moldova, was listed as Moldovan and not Gypsy, because of course it was another ethnic category that was deemed problematic. So it's interesting to see how throughout Soviet decades after the war, these children's nationalities are reported somewhat differently and children themselves um, kind of reflect differently on, on their past and on their belonging. Um, so this is Yuldash Fyodor uh, when he, was reunited with his grandmother in Ukraine in 1986. I put the picture of Yuldash with his biological family and with his adoptive mother, Bakhri, on the right. So this is Yuldash again with his grandmother. 
And this is the Moldovan uh, Roma um, girl some five years ago, I think. She still lives in Tashkent. She's one of the last, I think, um, Shah Mahmud of adaptees who still lives in the original home that the family resided in during the war. Um, so what happens with the story afterwards is that um, in 1950s and 1960s, um, there is a need to kind of modernize Shah Mahmudov's, even though Bahri never learns Russian and she is a housewife because she has to look after all of these children. Um, they try to modernize and show, you know, some sort of like crucifying and adjustment of the family through uh, introducing another adoptive family, this time from Moscow. So the family's last name was Mamenko. They resided in Moscow. They adopted, I think, 10 children. And so superficially, like this meeting of these two adoptive families, of Uzbek, Shah Mahmudovs, and Russian Mamenkos is kind of staged. Uh, it's covered in the newspapers. And um, Shah Mahmudovs traveled for the first time in 1963. They traveled to Moscow. They toured the Kremlin. They attend the Women's Congress. Um, Ahmed even gives a speech at the Women's Congress. It's interesting that Ahmed, uh, husband and not the wife, gives a speech at the Women's Congress. So all these kind of bilateral um, relations between various nationalities keep happening. And of course, that notion of the friendship of people keeps being reinforced. But what becomes problematic is that what do you make of these children who are not ethnically Uzbek, who are not Central Asian at all? who are either Slavic or, you know, um, or Jewish or whatnot. And they claim now in their interviews that they are Uzbek. Um, that creates a problem of uh, presenting the story, fitting it into the uh, friendship of people's um, notion. So Here's a brief list. It's from 1960s of uh, children, their nationality, their age at the time, their occupation, marital status. So that kind of, you know, shows, provides a stereoscopical uh, vision of um, how, how truly multinational or not the family was. So for example, um, Russian boy, whose original name was Mikhail, had been named Hamidullah in the family. And later on, he married another adoptive child from the same family, an Uzbek girl, Muazam. So interestingly, she's next in this list. Number three is Muazam. She married Mikhail Hamidullah uh, and they had four children. And interestingly, this story, even though mentioned in the Soviet press, it had never been celebrated as a mixed uh, family because, you know, it was quite popular um, and, you know, was kind of supported and celebrated to have a mixed family of different uh, ethnic backgrounds. But somehow this story of Mikhail and Muazam had never been really celebrated um, in the newspaper covers, perhaps because it was problematic. There were technically there were siblings, even though not biological ones. And also because well, what do you make of the child of the Russian kid who adopted an Uzbek name? And now it's not really clear if it's multi-ethnic, multicultural family or not. So there are all sorts of um, issues with fitting these children into the pre-war and the wartime friendship of people, um, of identifying them, because what do you use as the belonging? Do you use their ethnicity? Do you use their cultural or linguistic belonging? What exactly makes them Uzbek or Soviet? Um, also, there is, um, besides Yuldash and Ergash, whom we mentioned already, the Jewish kids, there's Habiba, whose real name is Dina, she's Russian. Um, there's Bova, who's also Russian. Um, some of these kids did find their biological families after the war. Some of them were only fostered and not adopted. But most of them who stayed had retained the Shah Mahmud of Uzbek last name, and they retained their Uzbek adoptive names. Um, which sort of creates a problem for, um, for self-identification, for ident identification by the Soviet state for propaganda, whatnot purposes. So I think I'll, um, 
I'll try to wrap it up here by posing certain questions. So here we see how in 1960s and onward, there is a problem of, um, of using this friendship of people notion as a multinational concept because the nationality itself, Soviet nationality becomes um, somewhat problematic and not well identified um, concept. So um, when it becomes even more difficult, um, so there is no unified Soviet people because if we go back to uh, what Francine Hirsch, for example, wrote about uh, early nationality policies, 1920s and 1930s before the war, um, these nationalities, the assimilation of different nationalities into the single Soviet people was supposed to happen at some point. Um, under mature socialism. And it seems like um, this actually is not happening. So um, also as Adrian Edgar shows, dilemmas of multiple identities and belongings were difficult to reconcile. While Soviet attitude towards the mixed marriages was on the whole quite favorable for children of these mixed marriages, it was not possible to declare a mixed identity or to claim a multiple nationality because by the Soviet official nationality grid, you can belong only to one. You can be either Uzbek or Russian, for example, you cannot be both. Um, so by their existence, these children destabilized the pre-war equilibrium of the neatly defined Soviet nationalities prior to these children's coming of age drawing together the of Soviet nationalities into a single Soviet people, Sovetsky Narod, was only imagined on paper. This children's mixed marriages have further upset the status quo and left the central press scrambling for precise definition of who they were, ethnically, culturally, linguistically. Stalin era friendship of people's model of hierarchical vertical kinship was transforming to something different when all these previously backward nationalities already reached their, you know, um, official modern status, what are, you know, these differences that hold these nationalities together? I'll be happy in the Q&A, perhaps answer the questions about how this transpired into the post, um, post-Soviet era, how these people found themselves belonging to what nationalities and how this all played out in the post-Soviet context when this, um, you know, it, it, we can see how in the Soviet era, these children are basically using the term, I'm a Soviet person to kind of try to reconcile, at least on paper, these problems of national belonging. But what do they do after the Soviet Union collapses and even that supranational um, identity is gone? Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Zohra. This was fantastic. And if you'd like to hear more of her research, uh, this Friday, uh, the Jordan Center will be hosting Zuhra's talk on how one of the largest collections of Soviet avant-garde art came, came to be hosted in a provincial Uzbek museum in Nukus, Karapakistan. So our next speaker, just like Harold Weaver, comes from outside of the Slavic field. Claudia Sadovsky-Smith is professor of English and American studies at Arizona State University specializing in comparative border studies, international migration of people and texts. She is the author of three books, most recently and probably most relevant, uh, relevantly for her talk today, The New Immigrant Whiteness, New Liberalism, Race and Post-Soviet Migration to the United States. Thank you, Claudia, for joining us. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you to Watson and Sasha, especially for uh, create, for organizing this panel. I'm trying to now share my presentation. Um, let's see if I can do it. Yeah, here we go. Okay, um, so uh, I wanted to just mention that, can you see my presentation okay? Um, okay, well, I wanted to mention that Sukhra's presentation actually provided a very nice transition for me because uh, I will also be looking at adoption, in this case, US adoption from post-Soviet Russia and Ukraine as one of the case studies for understanding how post-Soviet migration to the United States is racialized. And by post-Soviet migration, I mean uh, migration that happened since uh, the, the late 1980s. 
Um, so the census data show us that in 2014, uh, 1.2 million people in the United States said that they were or stated that they had been born in the former USSR or in post-Soviet nations, various post-Soviet nations. This actually makes them the eighth largest immigrant group before the South Korean and Dominican Republic diaspora. And uh, those two groups are a lot more uh, widely studied than the post-Soviet diaspora, which is interesting, I think. Uh, my talk draws on this book that uh, Ross had mentioned, my most recent book, The New Immigrant Whiteness, in which I show, among others, these are two of the things I talk about, um, that in the absence of other available concepts, the newly arriving migrants from the former USSR are understood in the United States as inheritors of turn of the 20th century European immigrant, European immigrants who achieved whiteness to upward mobility. So whiteness, as I will explain in a little, in a little bit, has a lot of very different um, shades of meaning uh, in the United States. It brings together concepts of racial identity as based on shared geographical origin, which initially allowed these early immigrants I uh, talked about access to legal rights like naturalization, but also with economic notions of upward mobility. And then uh, I also show in the book how this type of US specific whiteness is expanded to populations who are not just migrating, but still live on the geography of, uh, of the former USSR and in post-Soviet nations. They are assumed to share a racial identity with European identified Americans. And this, this assumption actually promoted family migration in the form of adoption and marriage migration. Um, a, a couple of words about the diversity of the US post-Soviet migration. Um, as far as I could tell, there are at least three major ways in which they are internally very diverse, even though they're a cycle state and a little bit collectively racialized as white in the United States. Uh, number one, which is actually one of the foci of my book is there's a large legal diversity, maybe the largest of any diaspora. Um, in, until the 1990s, virtually all migrants arrived as Jewish refugees, but that number had decreased uh, significantly by the end of the 1990s. And then uh, post-Soviet migrants became the second largest group of adoptive and marriage migrants after uh, Chinese adoptees and Filipina marriage migrants. Um, of course, the, the Jewish refugees received uh, substantial help from aid organizations, whereas uh, the, the, the incorporation of adoptive and marriage migrants in the United States functioned in very different ways. Um, in addition to refugee and, my, and family migration, a significant number of post-Soviet migrants also come on highly skilled visas, the H1Bs that have been in the news recently, and there are those and, uh, to, uh, who also overstay uh, visas and become undocumented. In addition to these distinctions, as, as we just heard about and was discussed, there's also, of course, a variety in terms of what this, the immigrants themselves think about as nationality. Um, and uh, while Russians and Ukrainians, which can be considered Slavs, as was just explained, Make, made up the, uh, still make up the majority of the, um, of the migration of the diaspora, uh, those who come from the Caucasus and Asia are also, those numbers are increasing. And a small percentage of those are actually self-identified in the census data uh, as not white uh, or believe that they're um, racialized as non-white in the United States. And they chose these very you know, imperfect categories as other Asians or Pacific Islander, uh, members of two major races or black. So despite this diversity, however, uh, the few existing popular discourses that I found, and I'll talk about in a little bit, and representations of the post-Soviet diaspora racialize its members as collectively white and successors of turn of the 20th century immigrants from Europe uh, who are uh, associated with idealized narratives of their cultural assimilation to US whiteness that, uh, that, uh, that happens to upward mobility. And the most important thing, or one really important thing about this is that this whiteness is then always contrasted with the non-whiteness of the majority of contemporary immigrants, particularly those racialized as Latinx, those who come from Mexico and Central America, who are often associated in, in, uh, in our popular narratives with undocumented status. So what's happening is that these post-Soviet migrants are rendered fundamentally different from these other groups. And also, secondly, as wanting to set themselves apart from these groups. Um, the racialization of post-Soviet migrants thus falls directly in, into the dichotomy between the supposedly white immigrants from Europe who came in the 19th and 20th century and the majority of contemporary immigrants who are arriving from Mexico and Central America and racialized as Latinx. 
Whiteness and more historians have highlighted how these early European immigrants actually, and particularly the largest numbers who came from Italy and the Russian empire had to undergo a process to become fully white and achieve full access to the legal, economic and racial rights of whiteness. So while these immigrants were white on arrival because their origin in Europe provided them with legal access to naturalization, they were also, and they were also exempt from institutionalized racialized exclusion and violence that was directed against non-white populations. But on the other hand, especially Irish, Southern and Eastern Europeans, at least for a while, were perceived as not quite white. They, were, they suffered some social stigma and exclusion, occasional exclusion from public life. They earned less than native born whites and Eastern and Southern Europeans were selectively excluded from admission through 1920s the 1920s quota acts, which as you know, were based on the uh, eugenic uh, theories of differences among various different European races. Uh, and so in order to, us, to assess all these facets of whiteness, uh, theories go, and there's obviously some, um, uh, some evidence to back this up. What these, uh, these uh, immigrants had to do to become completely white is to embrace uh, um, state-sponsored supremacy and violence, which included practicing hostility toward non-white contemporaries, particularly African Americans and, and Chinese immigrants. So uh, for example, Jewish and Italian immigrants tried to prevent the influx of larger numbers of African American uh, African Americans into their neighborhoods in the early 20th century. So what happened by the end of the Second World War is that European Im immigrants and especially their descendants had acquired access to many of the economic facets of whiteness in ways that were not available to the other non-white groups. And that is because they benefited disproportionately from the expanded US social welfare state, such as uh, subsidized mortgage loans, unemployment, retirement funds, GI bill benefits, and job protections. So by the end of, the, of World War II, a notion of, of whiteness had um, developed that encompassed all of those of European background, even though, and this is a disclaimer, the, the large, a large number of those coming from the former Russian empire had also assimilated to a Jewish American identity that had been created by mid 19th century East Central European Jews, and then has of course retained a rather difficult relationship to whiteness. How exactly is this concept of a post-World War II whiteness that encompasses everyone of European descent and promises upward assimilation through uh, mobility associated with post-Soviet migrants? Was the question I asked myself in the book. And to find the answer is I actually had to go to the realm of popular culture and particularly uh, the genre of reality TV, which emerged in the 1990s at actually at about the same time as uh, the large groups of uh, post-Soviet migrants arrived in the United States and elsewhere. So I look at two uh, examples, two reality shows in the book. And uh, the first one is Russian Dolls, which was created by two 1.5 generation post-Soviet immigrants after the example of the widely popular Jersey Shore, which you see there on the slide in the lower right. And uh, this was actually the first show to portray members of what were supposedly uh, the same ethnic subculture, namely Italian Americans. The subculture is a remnant of the fact that Italian Americans were actually the last among other European groups to achieve upward mobility. And so in this ethnicized subculture stresses exercising, tanning, partying and consumption as a way to appear more upwardly mobile. Um, so the casting call for Russian dolls that you see in the lower left there uh, actually calls for uh, cast members who would fall into similar stereotypical categories as those portrayed on Jersey Shore and would focus on similar practices of consumption as a means for providing at least the appearance of upmobility. So the show depicts this emergent Russian, they call it Russian ethnic subculture within discourses about uh, upward mobility, but it also stresses the hostility of this group toward those who are perceived as non-white, specifically those uh, racialized as Latinx. The first of the, the 12 episodes, this show only stayed around for 12 episodes, focuses on a cast member who's breaking up with her supposed Spanish boyfriend because he's not Russian. And she says that she's encouraged by her family to do so. I'm going to try to share um, this, this clip from, um, from YouTube because um, it actually, okay, let me see if I can do this. I don't seem to be able to do it, but I'm going to go to 
I downloaded it, but it's a little bit out of sync. So um, let's see. Okay. So just you can still get the. Gist. I wanted to talk to you. Like you know, I'm Russian, and it's like it's it's whole entity, and like the people are different, and and what we do, and everything like that. And I I enjoy hanging out with you, and it's cool, but can it go further? When you first met me, did you think that there was a future? I wouldn't have asked you out if I didn't think there was a Like, future. okay, what kind of future? The kind of future that most people want. Like marriage? Of course, wife, kids. It's like, I feel bad. What do you feel bad about? That I can't be with you. Because I'm not Russian? Yeah. So you're telling me that uh, what your family thinks dictates what you do but it's hard because it's like what if, what if people fall in love with someone they're not supposed to be with i think people from different cultures and religions fall in love with each other all the but time but the reality is is my family gonna take you in my parents they came to america for a reason to see me grow to up look for russians yeah that's what i have to be with and i'm gonna do it but you know i really want the best for you I'm ready whenever you're ready. Okay, so what we see here, um, interestingly enough, is um, that, the sh that the show, the depiction of the show, um, really um, downplays the fact that uh, this cast member is actually Jewish. You can see the Star of David. She's wearing a necklace around her neck. And that her family um, is trying to encourage her to marry within the Jewish faith and, uh, and, and religion, which is, which is actually a pretty common practice not necessarily something that is limited to uh, supposed, supposed members of the Russian diaspora. And maybe we can talk about this later, but the very same thing happens in the second show that I look at, which is uh, of course the, the very famous Dancing with the Stars, which is a British franchise and has hired um, ballroom dance for professionals, many of whom were trained in the former USSR or in post-Soviet nations to partner with the listed celebrities. The show's focus also show focuses on 1.5 immigrants, even though increasingly there are also second generation immigrants on the show as well. Um, and some of these professionals are actually given, were given airtime in the past and are shown to have immigrated with their parents who came to afford their children a better life and their own downward economic and social mobility after their migration is thought to have been made up by their migrant children's upward mobility, which is afforded to them through their participation in dance sport and in this particular reality TV show. And as in Russian Dolls, the Jewish identity of many of these professionals and the fact that, they, that many likely, the ones that I could track down, likely came as Jewish refugees with their families is downplayed. Um, at the same time, um, we have this, um, uh, this, this narrative that continues from whiteness scholarship, which I explained earlier, uh, in dance scholarship, which has associated the dominance, the increasing dominance of post-Soviet professionals in U.S. dance board with the history of 20th century Irish and Jewish entertainers donning blackface in order to assimilate fully into whiteness, in order to differentiate themselves from African Americans. And this new dan this dance scholarship calls post-Soviet professionals use of spray tanning in performances, which is uh, an integral part of ballroom dancing, a form of brown phase. And the assertion is that uh, these professionals engage in brown phase to reinforce their whiteness by setting themselves apart from the largest group of contemporary migrants from Mexico and, and Central America who are racialized as Latinx and often associated with undocumented status. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to mention when uh, members of the post diaspora, uh, diaspora are not, cannot be understood as both or either economically and racially white immigrants who follow this particular narratives, narrative of being um, inheritors of the idealized 20th century European immigrant uh, story. They are racialized as non-white and disassociated from the diaspora. And as an example, I wanted to mention that Zanev brothers who are responsible for the 2013 bombings, Boston Marathon from bombing, and they were called Chechen uh, all through all the newspaper coverage. Even though their mother was from Dagestan, a republic in Russia's dog Caucasus, they had never lived in Chechnya, and they migrated to the United States, had migrated to the United States um, with an asylum status that had allowed their naturalization as Americans. The Chechen designation helped emphasize the Tsarnaev's radicalization, the link to terrorism, which simply cannot be associated with whiteness. So 
I have here the May uh, 2013 cover of the week, which actually changed the, the features uh, of the Tsarnaev brothers, uh, changed their appearances to make them more appear more quote unquote Arab. And so in addition to highlighting the Muslim faith, the media also emphasized the family's failure to achieve the American dream in the United States, which further disassociated them from the post-Soviet di diaspora and its presumed linkage to the myth of um, immigrant upward mobility. The economic deprivation of the Tsarnaevs was so severe that the parents actually returned to Dagestan after a decade in the United States uh, while leaving their grown children behind. Um, the second part, uh, point I wanted to make from my book here is that this uh, model of you as whiteness, uh, which supposedly encompasses all of those as European dis descent, is extended, is also extended to residents of various post-Soviet nations, again, without necessarily recognizing the different, the distinctions uh, within uh, the, the, the nationality distinction, or ethnic distinctions within these nations. Um, so while the turn of the 20th century European immigrants only became white on arrival in the United States, residents of the former USSR are actually constructed as white even before they leave their countries of origin. So predominantly European identified US citizens sponsor the migration of children or women from the former USSR to create supposedly monoracial families, what they think of monoracial families. The designation of these women and children as white renders them desirable immigrants and also enables their migration under privileged legal categories. But this assumed whiteness also has a dark underside because it creates unrealistic expectations for these women and children's quick and complete assimilation to their new families. So marriage migrants, for example, are expected to completely assimilate at the cost of their and often their children's bicultural and transnational identities, and they, are, they become economically and legally dependent on their husbands. But I think more uh, poignantly, one can see this, the expansion of these, this US notion of whiteness uh, when one looks at actually a transnational adoption. And in here, I, uh, I studied, um, again, an, an, a, a growing genre of uh, adoption memoirs written by uh, adoptive parents, US adoptive parents themselves, about their experience of adopting primarily from Ukraine and Russia. Um, I read many of those, but focus on three particular ones, and they were written by a variety of people, a businesswoman, child psychologist, university professor. What's, what was most striking in these memoirs is that the authors can dispense with the traditional views of adoptive parents as humanitarians who are adopting to save foreign children, and, in, and instead they portrayed themselves as neoliberal consumers who have the right to adopt healthy and white children who look as though they could be biologically related to them. This fiction of global whiteness not only turns post-Soviet adoptees into preferred uh, uh, commodities and privileged migrants, such as marriage migrants as well, but it also normalizes the rejections of adoptable children as mere obstacles on the path to what these parents think of as adoptive invisibility, the fact that they don't necessarily have to share with the world that their children are adopted because they supposedly look so similar to them. As paying consumers, parents feel empowered to reject referrals simply because their children uh, don't fit racially into their families. So one of the examples here is um, from an account by university professor Brooks Hansen, and you see her on, on the left hand uh, of the screen, who cites, uh, uh, who writes that they, they, uh, they, they turned out a referral because this actually very, very small baby had listed him, the referral had listed him as a Caucasian, but there was reason to think that this might not have been entirely true. His statement that the couple's decision against forming a transnational family was, quote, part of the reason that they had come to Russia reveals the family's inability to grasp how differently the concept of race works outside of the United States, specifically their ignorance of the former Soviet Union's internal diversity that we just heard about in the previous presentation. The authors believe that they share a pre-existing white racial identity with these post-Soviet children also produces expectations of their complete and immediate adaptation in ways that ignore their cultural and linguistic distinctiveness and include the potential to develop bicultural or transnational identities and the challenges associated with their status of adoptees. And this ignorance might explain, might help explain the significant numbers of death, abuse, and terminations of adoption when the adoptee does not quickly enough adopt or sufficiently enough adapt or present with health issues as was manifested, manifested in the high profile termination of Artyom Savelev's adoption in 2010, which you might remember 
uh, when uh, a then seven-year-old boy was sent back, uh, quote unquote, uh, and accompanied on a plane to Moscow by his adoptive US mother because he was supposedly violent and mentally ill. What was interesting about the case was that the US media initially condemned the mother's actions as a form of adoption consumerism, but then quickly shifted to focus on the boy's mental and behavioral problems. And uh, experts and adoptive parents expressed sympathy for the mother's decision. And speculatively, of course, the child had not been diagnosed associated Artyom's behavior with reactive attachment disorder. This very controversial diagnosis attributes a child's failure to bond with their adoptive parents to attachment interruptions in early life. But few reports address, because of the focus on this particular diagnosis, how the problem, his own Artyom's problematic treatment in the United States, where he was homeschooled and largely kept at home, may have continued to uh, contributed to the unfavorable outcome of this adoption. So um, I don't wanna uh, dwell, on, dwell on this, but you probably remember that because of uh, the mistreatment of many of these adoptees, Russia actually terminated adoption from Russia in 2013. Uh, one, one last example from my book that I wanted to mention is that beyond looking at these globalized notions of US whiteness as facilitating family migration from the, from the former USSR, I also examine uh, depictions of post-Soviet undocumented migration. There's very little um, actual, there, there's very little, very little data on this. So I have to go to fictionalized de de depictions of undocumented immigration. And there are specifically two novels I looked at um, by one, first and one by generation po uh, post-Soviet immigrant writers. And these novels by portraying undocumented migration actually opened the door to comparative approaches to post-Soviet migration that would look, put them in a larger context uh, with other contemporary U.S. migration. Sana Krasikov and Anya Olinish's work represent ethnic, ethnically and uh, racially diverse protagonists from Russia, Georgia, and Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan, who arrive in the United States on non-immigrant visas and become undocumented here. And these works move beyond the themes of assimilation that dominated 20th century cultural productions by Eastern European immigrants of Jewish descent, which laid the foundation for literature of assimilation to U.S. whiteness. Instead, this fiction, actually by Krasikov and Lineage, positions post-Soviet characters' experiences of diminished access to the US labor market, residency rights, and citizenship rights into the larger context of contemporary US migration, as it is undergoing significant shifts in the contemporary, US, uh, in the contemporary new liberal moment. Um, so my conclusion would be that um, the association of whiteness, of this narrative of whiteness uh, that comes out of uh, studies of uh, 20, 20, turn of the 20th century European immigrants with post-Soviet immigrants assumes that whiteness has remained unchanged since World War II. As I had pointed out, it was first at the time this racial, legal, and economic identity um, was first consolidated through an expanding US welfare state and in the context of a relatively well-functioning capitalist economy. In the current neoliberal context, none of these factors are true. Um, a diminished welfare state and growing economic inequality actually reduce the chances for upward mobility, mobility particularly for immigrants. Um, you might have seen some of the studies that show that the United States is now one of the countries with the least upward mobility uh, possible. So I would suggest an, a need for comparative approaches to whiteness that set it alongside other racial formations. And while we still need to acknowledge the continued centrality of whiteness as a racial category, to which many members of the post-Soviet diaspora have access, the participation of post-Soviet migrants in various migratory forms, as well as their internal racial and economic diversity points to similarities with other contemporary migrants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. You know, if the story Zuhra told is really unimaginable anyway in the post-Soviet space, yours um, sheds light onto um, our reality. And it's um, interesting that this light has to come onto a Slavic field, has to come from American studies, for which we're very, very thankful. So finally, as our uh, moderator, we're uh, really very lucky to have Maxim Matusevich, a professor of history at Seton Hall University, where he directs the Russian and East European Studies program. 
Maxim is the leading scholar for Russo-African relations and the person who's probably uh, thought more than anybody else about Russia's relationship with race. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rossen, and uh, uh, thank you for this kind of introduction. I'm not sure I'm the person who thought about it more than uh, Hal, for example, uh, who's been doing a lot of thinking before many of us even started questioning those concepts. Um, so it was great to see Hal, it was great to see uh, Zuhra and uh, Claudia here and Rossen, as always. Uh, we don't have that much time left. Uh, obviously, I would have a lot to say. Uh, about each one of those fascinating presentations. So I think what I'll do, I'll just say a couple of words and then I've collected, uh, that's why I sometimes was not looking at the screen. I was actually taking down notes and taking pictures of the questions. And I'll group those questions as per each presenter and each one of you will get uh, some time to respond to them. Some of the questions overlap, so I'll sort of try to group, group them in such a way that uh, it'll be easier for you, I think, to respond uh, concisely. Um, as I was listening, especially uh, Hall when he started out, I was thinking about the two episodes that happened in the last uh, 48 hours. Uh, I don't know if I assume many of the listeners are following the news. Uh, Mike Tyson was fighting uh, Roy Jones uh, and, and in an exhibition game. And uh, I was thinking about Roy jo uh, Jones, who five years ago um, accepted Russian citizenship from Vladimir Putin and is on record praising uh, Russia for absence of racism, as he claims it. Uh, obviously, he leads a very privileged life out there. And uh, uh, he made some of those claims on uh, uh, Russian channel RT. And that's where RT comes into play, because in the last 24 hours, a scandal broke out uh, when uh, one of the presenters uh, on his show uh, performed a, a really disgusting racist skit of President Obama. And uh, the presenter is the husband of um, uh, the leader of RT channel, uh, Margarita Simonian. Both of them are Armenians. And in his, sort of, his attempt to calm down the passions, he made a claim that as an ethnic minority in Russia, he has the right to make those kind of jokes. So the complexity is being revealed even as we were preparing, preparing for uh, this presentation. Um, the first group of questions, uh, I'll address it to Hall and then uh, to Zuhra and then Claudia, and uh, I'll let you uh, deal with it. So uh, a lot of questions for Hall. Uh, Hall, um, several questions ask about uh, race relations within the walls of Lumumba University uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, we uh, read accounts of uh, uh, various uh, encounters between African students in Russia uh, in the Soviet Union at the time and other republics and the population outside the walls of the university. So the question, several questions actually address the issue of uh, those uh, relationship within the walls of the university. Uh, a couple of questions dealt with the question of Chinese students, uh, which I think is a fascinating question, especially in the beginning of the 1960s, when the rift between the Soviet Union and China was already quite obvious. And uh, besides the geopolitical tensions, there were also ideological tensions between the appeal of Maoism and the conventional Marxist-Leninist doctrine that was presented to uh, willing uh, uh, foreign students in the Soviet Union. So a couple of questions uh, ask you to comment on the presence of Chinese students uh, and to what extent Maoism and uh, a sort of extreme left interacted with the more conventional Marxist uh, Len Marxism, Leninism within the walls of Soviet institutions of higher learning. Um, for uh, Zuhra, uh, several questions. A um, couple of them deal with the issues of identity. Uh, what actually distinguishes uh, Uzbek I identity from a Soviet identity? Uh, at what point you stop being Uzbek and become Uzbekistanis, as uh, one of the questioners uh, put it. Uh, a question that sort of uh, crossed my mind as I was listening to your absolutely fascinating presentation was about the history of evacuation and how the experience of evacuation, which affected hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Soviet families, actually forged the links between places like Leningrad and uh, Kiev and uh, Moscow and the so-called periphery. Uh, applies to obviously to Tashkent, especially to Uzbekistan, but also Kazakhstan or you know, the Urals or Western and Southern Siberia. So I wonder if you could reflect on that. 
Uh, another question for Zuhra uh, from actually a couple of questions had to deal with the issue of race, how you deploy that concept when you deal with, with the kind of research project that you engaged in and whether or not the way race functions in the West, especially in the United States, has any applicability to your own research project. Um, the question I had was also about the deportations of ethnic minorities. Uh, uh, some of them, I assume, ended up in Uzbekistan. Quite a few ended up in Kazakhstan. Whether or not those kids also ended up being adopted and how, because that's a very politically fraught issue, how it was actually articulated and whether or not it had political utility. Uh, also, I would uh, mention the word by my colleague, um, uh, Sarah Filston, who recently published a book about American adoptions during the Cold War and apparently the politics of adoptions. And that's something uh, I think that uh, Claudia also mentioned um, played a very important role in the Cold War and apparently after, you know, the, the adoption ban that was mentioned. Um, for Claudia, again, this is something that comes very close to my own area of concern. And, you know, what Rawson articulated at the beginning of, the, uh, of today's event, uh, the, the George Floyd murder uh, produced really vitriolic response from many quarters in uh, the former Soviet spaces, both in Russia and beyond. And uh, uh, I, I think for those of us who've been following that kind of discourse, uh, this didn't come as a complete surprise, as a complete shock, but very unpleasant uh, uh, phenomenon nevertheless. And I wonder if you could reflect on that, why the politics of the so-called post-Soviet liberals um, turn out to be so right-wing in many cases. And this is true, I think, in the former Soviet spaces. This is true in the metaphorical former Soviet spaces here in the United States. A very large segment of the post-Soviet diaspora uh, embraces, uh, and not just in the United States. The same is true for Israel. The same is true for Germany, as we know, with the Russians flocking into AFD. Uh, so uh, how would you explain uh, with reference to whiteness and you know this access to whiteness that these populations gain once they cross the border, whether or not you can see a connection between that and the right-wing politics, uh, which are very common uh, uh, within segments of post-Soviet diaspora. And um, uh, the last quick comment I wanted to make, uh, and as Claudia was making her absolutely fantastic presentation, uh, really, I'm looking forward to reading your book. You know, I, and I'm not just saying it, I'm going on whatever we go to get a book right after the presentation and getting a copy for myself in our library. Um, Meredith Roman, a uh, historian, uh, published a book a few years ago where she talks uh, about uh, the uh, anti-racist uh, anti Soviet campaigns, especially in the 1920s and 30s. And she made a very interesting observation in that book that some of those campaigns actually ended up being an attempt to reclaim whiteness. That is the whiteness that had been taken away from the Russians uh, by, by the West. And uh, it was a way to reclaim whiteness by claiming high moral ground. And I was thinking how interesting right? We have this revolutionary project, which reclaims whiteness. And then we have Perestroika and the sort of anti counter revolutionary project, which also tries to reclaim uh, whiteness, but in very different terms, sort of to live like a belly человек, you know, to, to, to live like a, a real white person, you know, South Africa became very popular among Soviet intelligentsia by the end of the 1990s. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 1980s, at the height of perestroika for the same reasons. Uh, racism was downplayed. Uh, so both revolutionary and anti-revolutionary discourses somehow try to reclaim whiteness in this case. And uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, there are more questions coming in, but uh, each one of you got a lot, I believe. So maybe if you can just limit yourself to a few minutes each, because we don't have much time, but I'll be quiet from this point on. Thank you. Paul, do you mind going first in the order that you, you present? Thank you, Maxime. I, I appreciate your summary and your synthesizing. And I appreciate Rosen for inviting us. It's been a, a very rich gathering and interaction today. And I hope we can keep the dialogue going the first question you directed at me um, related to the race relations within the walls of Lumumba University and outside the walls of Lumumba University. 
my, um, my recollection of the situation within the university is based strictly on my interaction with African students. Um, I now, I have a, a good friend who is a scholar and who teaches at Lumumba University now, who had been a student there. And I will, after this, uh, raise this question with her. What I have to say is very brief, is that from my observations and my interaction with African students, there was a very good relationship between African students, at least those whom I interacted with, and the rest of the uh, Lumumba University. As you know, the, there were roommates assigned, so people got to know each other quite well. There was, uh, each African tended to have a, uh, have a Russian, uh, at least set of Africans had Russian roommate. Um, so I, the, from what I observed, very <clears throat> positive relations, and especially the male-female one that I mentioned earlier, which, and obviously some resentment of, <coughs> sorry, jealous um, Russian males. Um, outside of the university itself, my observation, as I indicated, they were very generally positive relationships. The negative relationships that I observed at least and that African students reported to me was when Russian men and women were drunk, which was not unusual in a vodka culture, uh, that there were some nasty things said more about Khrushchev, the leader, than about the students themselves, blaming, blaming, blaming him for having those foreigners there. In terms of the second question you raised about Chinese students in the USSR, I, relations were very poor between the USSR and China at that time. I'm not even sure if there were Chinese students there in the early 60s, and if they were there in how large a number. I remember two incidents that happened that were widely reported in the Soviet uh, press, at least. One was Chinese visitors or students locking themselves in on the Trans-Siberian Express and defecating all over their, um, defecating all over their room, roomettes on the car. So that was a very negative thing. And we were also um, told when the, at the Friday, the weekly Friday meeting that the American correspondents had with the American ambassador, in this case, Ambassador Foy Kohler, I remember a fellow American journalist telling me and telling us that Japanese tourists were advised to wear cameras around their necks so that they would not be confused with Chinese who apparently had a ne negative reputation even in the Soviet population. So that's about all I have to say um, um, about those uh, two questions that you raised. Okay, thank you so much, Hall. And uh, um, I don't know if you can see Q&A, there are quite a few questions for you, but there is some overlap there. Okay, uh, thank you. Zuhra, can you? Yeah, thank you very much, Max, for summarizing these um, for us. So um, about the identity being Uzbek versus Soviet and using say Uzbekistan, it's meaning Uzbek from Uzbekistan as an interchangeable probably. Um, word for it, right? I was thinking that Uzbekistan, it's, that's what some of these uh, adoptive kids used when they were adults already and they were interviewed, they used I'm Soviet Uzbekistani, but mm -hmm. that becomes problematic because of this uh, labor uh, mobility that was in the late Soviet Union when, for example, you get an education Uzbek SSR and then you get assigned to work in Kazakh SSR or in Ukraine or elsewhere. So that becomes like you've been born in Ukraine, you've been raised in evacuation of Uzbekistan, then you migrate to say, I don't know, Belarus or Kyrgyz Republic, whatnot. So it becomes problematic by defining yourself by a place 
because you travel so much. So I don't think that worked exactly. Maybe it worked for those adoptive kids who stayed in Uzbekistan. They could passion themselves as Uzbekistanis, Soviet ones. But for those who traveled, it probably did not work. That's why there, there is a problem finding one proper classification that will work to like encompass all the differences of their geography, ethnicity, culture, and language. And that is one of the you know, major problems of the Soviet taxonomy. Uh, in terms of whether did they become uh, perfect Uzbeks, I think uh, because like someone in the comment section um, noted that this Stalinist taxonomy had never actually been altered and changed uh, after the war, if you use the same old Stalinist taxonomy, no, it is impossible to become purpose, perfect Uzbek if you've been born ethnically Jewish. Um, that's why they probably add this Soviet Uzbek to their self-identity because they're not Uzbek by Stalinist taxonomy, which includes language, culture, geography, and ethnicity. They cannot change their ethnicity. They can fashion themselves as Uzbeks and put it in their passport because of course, Soviet passports had both um, nationality and citizenship. Of course, by citizenship, they were all Soviets, but by nationality, they had to choose. Um, and we can be just one ethnic thing, basically. You cannot just be Uzbek slash Jewish slash Ukrainian, whatnot. So that's why, of course, it's very painful to basically, from your hybridism trying to claim identity, which is so multifaceted because you've been raised by so many different people in so many different places across the Soviet geography, you have to pick one. And that becomes a problem. And that's why these children do not fit into this category, um, into any of the categories, like they don't fit solidly. <laughs> Let's put it this way. In terms of the race, um, again, this is a limitation, I think, of the Soviet discourse, because if you just do the keyword search for the word race um, in anything, in that pertains to these adoptions, you will not find a single mention of the word race. Because I think the, the propaganda itself was always fashioned as opposing to, you know, like racial tensions or, you know, inequalities in the West. And so Soviets just avoided just saying, we don't have these issues at all. So the question of race just eliminated totally. All they have is the same old Stalinist notion of nationalities and ethnicities, even though, I mean, obviously, like you would think that the Central Asians and Ukrainians would be very, very different. And of course, even if you, based on your adoptive parents' uh, ethnicity, if you would fashion yourself as Uzbek, even in your passport, I'm sure these people would get questions like, Oh, so you're Uzbek, but you look like Russian or like Slavic, you know, you look white or whatnot. So, um, and lastly, answering the question somebody else asked, whether these children themselves, when they grew up, did they have any problems with self-identification? No, no one of them in the interviews or, you know, for the newspapers or uh, in private interviews, they never mentioned problems with self-identification, but I would think there were multiple issues, just like, you know, if a Ukrainian kid or any Slavic kid with blue eyes and blonde hair who has Uzbek in their passport, I'm sure they would get a lot of questions and it would feel rather uncomfortable to explain. Um, and also, I mean, these adoptions were widespread. I think officially in statistics, only Uzbek Republic adopted 200,000 unaccompanied children during the war. That's a lot, but it's very diff difficult to trace the original ethnicities of these kids because of course, when they were adopted, their nationality had been changed to where the adoptive family wanted them to have as their official nationality. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much for all the questions. Excellent, Zuhra, thank you so much. And uh, Claudia. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, that was a lot of questions thrown at me there, <laughs> Maxime. I'll try to take a step and stab at uh, some of that, but um, let me first say something about the two questions that I got in the Q&A. And the first one was about the term Caucasian. And if I had more time, I would have elaborated on that. And that's actually the really interesting thing, right? What I'm trying to show here is that um, when we look at race in, in, with post-Soviet um, migrants or immigrants, we actually 
two, two different uh, ideas of race or ethnicity or nationality collide, those are the notions that are typical, were typical in the Soviet Union and are still uh, apparently pretty dominant and put in the post-Soviet space. And then of course, American notions, US American notions of race. So in the US, Caucasian means white. <laughs> you know? And of course, in, in the post-Soviet context, it, it doesn't mean white, right? It means exactly the opposite. So, but that's not something that this particular US adoptive parent knew. And that was where every all this confusion came in. And I mean, this was a little, I believe was a six week old baby. So to be able to look at this baby in Russia in, in, an, in an IQ, you know, uh, and to, to like say that this baby does not look white to us, or they've used the term Caucasian, uh, is, is astonishing, right? And so it actually was supposed to be, it's supposed to be had Asian uh, eyes, you know, is what, that's the term that's used by this professor uh, in, in his, uh, in a memoir that was published by a university press. So it's, it's very interesting um, reading these memoirs, that's what I was trying to get at, how little, um, U.S. Americans, even educated ones, uh, have uh, how, how, how little of an idea they have of how race, that race does not work the same way everywhere, right? And, and they're so completely surprised at this. A second question was at, about um, my use of the term the brown face that came from dance scholarship when looking at ballroom dancing. And, and here I would want to note that again, this, this particular scholar is using these older notions from U.S. whiteness scholars thinking about how immigrants from Europe had to be, become white, so by, actually become white because they were not completely white, right? By being, by setting themselves apart from African-Americans. So this is through, for example, one of the things they did was, was blackface, right? But actually in the contemporary context of these ballroom dancers in uh, the United States, that need to, uh, to reinforce this idea that they're actually white is no longer really there, right? So that's a, there's a real difference here. I think that this particular dance scholar does not take into account and then thinks about, uh, you know, spray tanning as a form of brown face. Well, of course, this is, this is a practice. I'm not saying it's a good practice. It's bad for many, many reasons, but it's a widely used practice everywhere in the world uh, for ballroom dancing. But in the United States, I guess what the point is that for the scholar in the United States, it just starts taking on all these other connotations, right? That the scholar is saying does not, they don't seem to be a, a clear to these dancers themselves. However, actually some of these dancers, especially one of the ones that I that I focus on in, in my book and also in other publications, Maxim Tmarkovsky, is actually has actually, who's from Ukraine and is at least, uh, you know, his father is Jewish, um, has actually talked about the fact that he feels as, as though in the United States in this particular context, he's in New York City and so on and so forth. Being Russian uh, is actually, and he uses the term Russian there, even though he's from Ukraine originally and his family over, later became Ukraine, um, uh, is actually sort of a form of racialization as well. So he's very aware of these, these things. Um, and it doesn't come out as much in the show itself because the show is very invested when they portray these dancers as just white. This is, and why is this so important? Because the, the idea is that there are some immigrants who are the right immigrants, right? And they're the good immigrants and they still do what they're supposed to do and they have upward mobility and they assimilate just the same way that our prior immigrants have. That's really, that, that's the whole function of these immigrants in these portrayals. So with regard to the questions that Maxime mentioned, I would just say as a shorthand, I think we need to talk about this way more because it's, I think it's super complex. Um, and I thought about this a lot too. I would say that whiteness as a concept is something, just whiteness itself, that has become globalized, not just in the way I was discussing it, but also in the way in which it is used, for example, in Europe to think about now, you know, a whiteness as opposed to all these other different notions. I think it's a notion that we haven't really had in, uh, that we hadn't really dealt with before in that particular way, that sort of undifferentiated way, I wanna call it. I'm very critical of this particular notion, as you might be able to tell. Uh, actually since the 1990s, you know, and again, since these transitions in the Soviet space and of course, East, uh, Eastern Europe or the East Blo Eastern Bloc uh, toward a globalized and neoliberal world. And that brought with, with itself, with, with it, I think, um, neoliberalism itself brought the demand to become more like, and there was always a demand before too, but become more like the rest of the West, which is now associated with this, with this whiteness, right? And trying to be white but also with a much more, you know, anti-communist, right? 
specifically anti-communist or anti-socialist ideology. So, and even if you, you don't necessarily find as, uh, you know, strongly articulated in the right-wing positions, it is definitely something that I think powers many, many of even the more liberal versions of this, right? And then, and, and then all this whiteness stuff gets attached to it. Um, and uh, I would say, actually, what I, what I try to say in my talks and what I do in my book is actually there's a, there's a portion of the diaspora, at least that I study, the post-Soviet diaspora in the United States, that is not that, especially second generation immigrants, but also 1.5 generation immigrants that are trying to establish a different type of you know, Russian quote unquote whiteness, right? Um, they have grown up in the United States, uh, more or less. They are very familiar with uh, these multi-ethnic discourses, and 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 they are and they are building, you know, coalitions, or they're very supportive of of folks and understand themselves as specifically immigrants in the same way that there are other immigrants as well in this country. So I have a whole portion of my book on that, and I just want to mention right now a Facebook group, for example, and their anti uh, anti-Trump post-Soviet group, which is very very. Um, explicit in its ideological left-wing meanings and, and, uh, and also in trying to make connections with other immigrants. And, and I did some uh, interviews, and you can read this in the book, with post-Soviet immigrants that show actually that there's a lot more support and, uh, and also by first-generation immigrants, um, but also 1.5 and two uh, second-generation immigrants for for uh, against, uh, for, I mean, against these discourses that are anti-immigrant specifically, and that are uh, and that are very often tied to notions of whiteness. So support for you know this this, this growing anti-immigration or I mean opposition against this anti-immigration agenda that we have seen under the current administration, but already were uh, was there before as well. And then lastly, I had one more point to make. Oh yeah, the other point I usually make too is you see similar attitudes among immigrants from other uh, formerly socialist countries or still socialist countries in the United States, especially first generation immigrants. So Cuban Americans, of course, they're in the news now a lot, but also uh, Vietnamese Americans, uh, to a certain extent, Chinese Americans. So it's not, it's not something that's specific to this diaspora. And that's why I'm, I'm struggling to say, what I'm trying to say is, there's a real danger to have this diaspora only associated with these notions of whiteness that also uh, include, you know, very uh, regressive and conservative polit politics as well. I think that is that is reductive and, uh, and that's certainly not something that is borne out if you look more closely. And again, I think there is a, a certain function, you know, an ideological function in having the diaspora uh, represented that way. Um, okay. And amen to that. That's really well put. Thank you so much, Claudia. And uh, I'm going to yield the floor to Rosen for making final remarks. Well, really, this has been an education, and I'd really like to thank how Claudia, Zucher, and Maxim for making it possible. Uh, and as Hal said, we have to find ways to continue this conversation in the future, and that would be um, the task, the task of, of the future. But in the meantime, I'd really like to thank the 128 of you who have stayed with us for two, uh, two hours and 10 minutes. Um, and uh, have, thank you and have a great day and see you soon. <laughs>